If you've ever sunk hours into a dollhouse micromanagement game, a what if I was a morally questionable city planner sandbox, or a legally dubious ride engineer simulator, you've probably noticed how every object has a neat little icon ready to be clicked, allowing you to choose the perfect road to replace that entire neighborhood you just decided to bulldoze for better traffic flow, or finally place that pool ladder you accidentally forgot about. Alternatively, maybe you're interested in hoarding an unreasonable amount of loot, hanging on to that one item you swear will be useful someday, but of course, now isn't the right time to use it. As you scroll through the ever-growing collection of junk you refuse to part with, you might have noticed how every item has a clear, distinct thumbnail. These icons don't just magically appear. Somewhere in the pipeline, they need to be generated and populated. And if you're working on a game with a lot of objects, manually creating thumbnails for everything can quickly become a massive time sink. So since this channel is often about finding ways to make life easier in development, I figured why not build a tool to help us automate it? Hi there, I'm Matt, and welcome to Game Dev Guide. In today's episode, we're going to look at how we can create a custom Unity editor tool that lets designers generate and export icons for game objects directly in the editor. Before we get started though, I'd like to take a quick second to thank the sponsor of this video, Bezzy Sidekick. Bezzy is the context-aware development assistant for game engines that quickly handles all the repetitive and boilerplate aspects for you so you can focus on the creative and complex parts of game development. It is currently for Unity only, but they have plans to expand it to Unreal and Godot in the future. Bezzy uses a real-time, deep context of your project, the code base, asset library, scene hierarchy, and components to provide the most customized and accurate assistance for you in building your game. It provides tailored code suggestions so you can generate exactly what you need, building on what's already existing in your project when you need it. Bezzy can also pinpoint the scripts, components, and parts of your scene causing issues, then propose custom fixes to help you identify performance bottlenecks and move towards efficient optimizations quickly. Because of its deep context, Bezzy can also offer technical explanations, breaking down complex systems so you can quickly grasp the why behind your code. With Bezzy, you can dive deeper without digging through half-baked documentation, out-of-date sample scenes, or endlessly scrolling through year-old forum posts. The important part for me is that Bezzy guarantees that your information stays between you and Bezzy's sidekick. Your project integrity and data privacy are totally secure, so your project stays 100% yours. It's currently in early access, so if you're interested, make sure to scan the QR code on screen now or click the link below to join the waitlist to be one of the first to use it. Thanks again to Bezzy for sponsoring the video. Now, let's get started designing our editor tool. I've got a little building game sample here. I can select objects from this menu and place them into the world. This menu box is dynamically populated via this list of sprites here, which is just a scriptable object that contains a name, an icon, and a prefab. Right now, each of the icons are empty, and so I'm just using the dummy text for each of the items. But I'd love if we could come up with an icon for each of the items and show them in the boxes here. What we want to do then is build a tool that would let us generate an icon automatically from this prefab data, save the image file in our project, and then assign it to our scriptable object here. So let's start by creating an edit window. The easiest and fastest way to do this is by using the wizard. In the project here, let's go to create, UI toolkit, editor window. And we'll name this icon thumbnail editor. This will create the three files we need. We'll clear out the little label that gets added into our C-sharp script for now, and we'll deal with the rest of it later. And then let's open up our UI builder, and let's clear this out too. Let's select our UXML file in the hierarchy here, and turn on editor extension authoring. And we'll add a new visual element with a list view, and another visual element as children. Let's also set our parent element to horizontal flex. We'll rename our list view list and we'll name our visual element as content. Then let's just do a quick bit of styling to make this look decent. So I've just given it a background and adding some border elements and some padding and that kind of thing. You can obviously do whatever you want here. The important part is that we have a sort of list area and a content area over here. Next, let's add a label as a child of our content element. And let's name it header. And style it to actually look like a header. So that's the first part of the window done. Let's go ahead and populate this list. 
In our C-sharp script, we'll get a reference to our list element, and then we'll assign that reference in our GUI method. We'll also make a list of our scriptable objects and grab any of them that we can find in the project using assetdatabase.findAssets, and then load them into our list. Then we'll assign this list to the item source property of our list view. Let's adjust the menu item here and set the path to something like tools, icon, editor. And then in Unity, let's make sure to assign our XML file into the Visual Tree asset property. And now if we go to tools, icon editor and open our window, we should see that we have all of our assets in our list. Now let's handle displaying our selected element. Let's create a new method called onSelectItem and assign it to our selection changed event of our list view. We'll create a reference for a selected asset, and then in this method, we'll assign the selected asset to be the index of the list. By adding the selected asset to the script, we can now take advantage of the binding features in UI Toolkit to dynamically populate some of our fields here. We'll set the data source type in our content to be our actual editor window script. And then as long as we serialize our asset data reference, if we add a binding to our label, we should be able to search for selected asset and grab the label of the asset that's selected. So if we save that, back in our script, we just need to navigate into our content box and set the script as our data source. Now our editor should update depending on what we click in the list. Okay, that's the basic boilerplate for getting our data handled. Let's move on to the fun stuff and start building out the components to build our thumbnail. What we're going to do is hook into a neat editor feature called Preview Scene. If you've ever looked at a material or a mesh, you've seen this. It's the little preview that appears in the inspector here. So we're going to take advantage of this and build our own preview scene in our tool here. And we'll use that scene as an output target for the texture that we export. There's quite a few steps to get this working, so I'll do my best to make this as coherent as possible. First, let's make a spot for our future Preview Scene's image to output to. So we'll make a new little visual element and we'll call this output. I'll set its size to about 256 pixels and align it to the center of our element. In our class, we'll add a texture 2D. Call this preview texture and make sure it's serialized. We can then bind the background image of this element to that texture we just created. Next then, we'll set up some properties for our objects and start creating the preview scene itself. In our select item script, if we don't already have a preview scene, we will create one by calling editorSceneManager.newPreviewScene. We'll also make sure that there's a camera object and set up some basic properties on the camera. We'll create a new render texture on the camera with our designated size and the format of ARGB float. And then we'll move the camera object to the preview scene using the scene manager move game object to scene method. And we'll tell the camera to only output the scene. So now we just need to tell our camera to render our texture. So let's create a method called update camera. And in here we'll tell our camera to render and we'll create a preview texture if one doesn't already exist. We'll set the active render texture to our camera target and then we'll read the pixels into our preview texture and we'll reset the active render texture. Now, when we look at our window, if we select an item, we should get a black texture. This means that we set our preview scene up and our camera is successfully rendering. This is great. All we need to do now is stage our object ready for its big photo shoot. Let's go ahead and instance our prefab from our data. On selection, we'll make sure that if it already exists, we destroy the previous one in the scene. And then we'll call the prefab utility dot instantiate prefab method to instance our object from our asset data and set the destination as the preview scene. We'll also make sure to zero out the transform and rotation so that it ends up in the center of the scene. If we check in our window, we probably won't see anything. Our camera is currently also in the center of the scene, so it's in the same position as our object. So we need to head into the script and make sure our camera is offset slightly when we add it to the scene. So now we should be able to see our object. I'd like just a little bit more control over the framing of our shot though. So let's quickly add some controls for our camera into our editor window here. Let's add two vector three fields into our content container. We'll name this one camera position 
and we'll name this one camera rotation. We'll get a reference to these fields in our GUI method of our script. And then we'll add a value change callback to them. And in these two methods, we'll set the new values onto our camera object and update the camera. We'll also make sure to set these fields values when we first instantiate our camera too. And now if we open up our editor window and select an item, we should have control over our camera. So this is great. Now we can adjust the framing of our camera and adjust our shot relative to each object that we want to get a shot of. Some objects aren't always facing the camera though. And rather than fiddling with the camera settings every time, we can add a quick slider to rotate our object as if it's on a turntable. So we'll add a slider and call this object rotation. Set its value between zero and 359 and add a label. In our script, we'll create a reference to the slider and same as before, we'll create a change event and we'll set the object's Y rotation based off of the value on the slider and make sure to update the camera. And there we are, we now have the basic controls for setting our shots up. We can click on objects, rotate them, reposition our camera, adjust the camera rotation. We've pretty much got everything we need to line up our icons. There are obviously tons of additional features you could add here, such as changing more of the camera settings or maybe even adding additional elements into the preview scene, such as lighting or post-processing. My objects are using an unlit shader and I think the way they look now is fine for a thumbnail. So I won't be bothering with anything else like that, but I'm sure you can experiment with the contents of your preview scene to meet the demands of your project. We have the basics of what we need for our icons now. So all we need to do is take this texture and save it as an image. In the builder, let's add a save button to the top right here. Then in our code, let's assign a new export method to the button when it's clicked. In this method, we'll set the depth texture mode on the camera and clear the scene color so that we get a transparent image. We'll then update the image rendering on our camera and we'll call a method called save texture as PNG, which we'll flesh out in a moment. This will save our file out. When we're done, we'll set the color back on the camera and update the camera texture again. Our save method is pretty straightforward. We'll take in a source texture and a file name string. We'll throw up a file panel for the user to determine where to save their image. And then we'll use the encode to PNG feature on the texture to get a series of bytes that we can write to disk using the write all bytes method. Now, when we click our save button, we should be able to choose where to save our image. And then if we take a look in our project here, here's our icon. We just need to set it as a UI sprite texture and it's a little dark, but if we uncheck this sRGB box here and set alpha is transparency, we should get our transparent sprite. Excellent. What we have to do now is capture the rest of my objects here and assign the icons into their scriptable object assets. Okay, so I've exported all of my icons and converted them into sprites. All I had to do was assign them to my scriptable object assets. You could obviously write a tool to do this for you, but there's only a few right now, so I'm just gonna go through and do those. Okay, so I've gone through and set all of the icons into my scriptable objects here. Now my UI displays a bunch of icons for all the props and I can browse through my list of available items with these nice little pictures to act as previews. This is a huge improvement over what we had before. As you can see, it's super easy to build an exporter tool like this. And hopefully this video has given you some ideas of how the concept can be applied to your own project. But that's about it for now. As usual, I'm just scratching the surface of what this tool could be used for. And I'm excited to hear about how you might choose to adapt this concept for your own needs. So if you've enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button and let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. If you're new to the channel, then consider hitting that subscribe button. And if you'd like to see more videos like this one, feel free to explore from the playlists on the channel or select one of the videos on screen now. As always, thank you very much for watching and I will see you again next time.